One day, a couple of weeks ago, while I was driving into town for some reason or another, I noticed activity in the Henderson Cove area. A construction crew was there dismantling the last ferry barge on the lake. I pulled over and sat there watching. I had recently learned that this barge, the last one left intact since opening the twin bridges in 1983, had been sold recently. The owners who had purchased the barge and a tug from the highway department many years ago had finally thrown in the towel. For years, they attempted to operate the ferry boat as a tourist attraction. It could be rented for birthday parties, weddings, family reunions, anniversaries, and for special occasions and outings. In the past 20 years, I had organized several parties on the barge myself as a mobile marine venue and as an excuse to throw a lake cruise party featuring one of my bands. Several years in a row, we played for parties on the ferry for Independence Eve, a special night on the lake complete with fireworks and lots and lots of boats. Whenever we scheduled a party, there was no problem selling out as the ferry could only legally accommodate about 100 people. When I was a kid, one of my fantasies was someday maybe to have a band and play a dance on the ferry with all my friends on it. How could I have known that years later, bridges would be built, the ferry would indeed be available to throw a party on a moonlit summer night? It turned out to be the perfect place to have a party, where the audience could indeed be called a captive audience. After all, once they boarded the ferry and it pulled away from shore, no one could leave or board. Everyone on board seemed to sense that this was an intimate affair and we were all thrown together in kind of a family unit. As the ferry cruised down the lake and the band played on into the dark, time seemed to stand still. It seemed only a short time had passed when out of the darkness loomed the shoreline once again and the parking lot would become once more visible, signaling the end of a perfect evening. It was always a party to brag about afterward, even if it rained, in which case we'd all stay under the canopy until the showers subsided. Those were some of the best times I can remember. Many old time friends still talk about a particular ferry party that stuck out in their minds. As my mind flashed back to the present sitting there, I remembered that I had my camcorder in the back seat of my car. So I whipped it out, drove over closer to the construction site, and shot some of the footage you see here of the crew cutting the barge up into four large pieces to be transported to Memphis, where it was to be reassembled and used for barge duty on the Mississippi River. I was overcome with emotion as I witnessed the process with pieces of the canopy lying here and a cable and a metal ramp over there. And as I shot this piece of local history slowly being dissected, I could not help but remember the hundreds, no, thousands of times I had crossed the lake on this very barge. I remember in the past thinking that someday progress would overtake our sleepy town atmosphere and the ferries certainly wouldn't be here forever, but at that moment it all hit me like a sledgehammer. It was a day of mixed emotions when they retired the ferry operation and opened the twin bridges to traffic, but seeing the dismantling of this barge on this day was a graphic culmination of the passing of years between October 1983 and February of 2004. There's no question that the bridges have vastly increased the quality of life for Baxter County residents. Living in Henderson, if I still had to cross the lake by ferry, it would be a tremendous setback to not only my business, but to our personal lives as well. And imagine the impact it would have on anyone's life being threatened or carried by an ambulance across a ferry today. Having said that, these modern technological marvels still spur bittersweet memories of the past. As a young man, I had to contend with the ferry schedules. 
In the daylight hours of summer, it was a very regular 15-minute turnaround between trips. But in the winter, it could be anybody's guess. You might wait on the hill for as long as 45 minutes with your car engine running so you could keep warm while waiting for that ferry to suddenly appear out of the fog and mist to fetch you. My personal curfew in those days was midnight on weekends, and the trip from town to the lake was anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes, depending on the traffic. So I had to say goodnight to my girlfriend at her house in town promptly at 11.30 in order to be at the ferry landing at Panther Bay at 11.45. The dash from the Henderson side to my house was only two miles, so I'd get home by 12.05, which was acceptable. If I was late, I was grounded, period. I can recall many a night I was running late with Trooper Bill Miles in hot pursuit on my heels, coming over the hill, honking my horn to the ferry, hoping that it was still there. Sometimes it had just pulled away and I was busted. Sometimes I'd be standing there holding onto the chain because they heard me honking, and as I'd slip up on the boat, they'd pull up that chain and hit the throttle. As we'd pull away, I could see the state trooper's car coming over the hill, and I had lived to tell the tale another day. It was a game back then between the trooper and I. Yes, I was young and stupid, and there was nowhere near the traffic we see today on Highway 62. The ride across the lake was another thing entirely. It's very difficult to describe the feeling you had as you glided across the lake on a hot summer night, the diesel engine running at a steady throbbing pace, sitting in your car in the orange glow of the ferry's incandescent bug lights. Windows rolled down with a constant breeze washing across your face. There are so many times that Charles Gibson would slam the hood of my car to wake me up as they lowered the ramp for us to drive off. There were also many late nights in the winter with fog and snow blowing furiously across the lake, and I would wonder just how they knew where they were. Well, one particular night, I learned firsthand that sometimes they were guessing. As we came up on the opposite side of the lake towards Panther Bay from Henderson, and we were about 15 feet to the left of the landing, we ran aground. They pulled it off the bank and took another shot at it, and as the ferry guys fought with the wind and the winter sleet and the frozen ropes, I found a new appreciation for these highway department workers who, like the proverbial postman, always got the ferry to the other side. We probably have some kind of a real romantic story next, Patty. Yes, we do, and there is something romantic about a ferry boat. Near Mountain Home, Arkansas, Robert Allen Lelly and Patricia Ann Ohlendorf carried the idea to the ultimate. They got married on the Highway 62 ferry boat that plies its way back and forth across Lake Norfolk. It was surely a first for the old ferry boat. The bride wore shorts, the groom wore shorts, as did the bridesmaid and the best man, even the Justice of the Peace. It was rather a strange sight. Still, some things never change, even on a ferry boat. The exchange of vows, the wedding ring, the embrace, and the champagne. But why on a ferry boat? Well, the happy groom, Robert Lelly, has an explanation. Seems for 20 years his parents up in Belleville, Illinois, brought him to the Lake Norfolk region on vacation. He just fell in love with the ferry boat. It became a fantasy with him. How wonderful he thought to get married on that boat. Patricia agreed, and so they were.
Yeah. August 8th. August 8th, 1980. 1980, 1225. It's official. Sometimes the ferry was full of vacationers and you could have a great running conversation with a total stranger for 15 minutes. My mother used to write all of her letters crossing the ferry. She always kept stationary in the back seat of her car. And I used to silently cuss that ferry when I'd come over the hill and spy a gasoline truck waiting at the front of the line. That meant we'd lose 15 to 30 minutes if the traffic count was low because they would not put on an extra ferry to carry the flammable vehicle across the lake all by itself, which was the law. I've seen a truck full of chickens run off the ferry dock out of control. There were feathers everywhere. And the very next morning, a lone rooster who had escaped was sitting on the roof of the tugboat crowing. I've also seen a charcoal truck, which had also lost control and ran right off the ferry dock on the Henderson side of the lake. Leroy, you want to tell me what what happened? Well, we uh, pulled on the ferry and parked, and uh, they asked us to move back a little to let another car on to hold the apron down, and the uh, truck wouldn't start because it was overheated from pulling. So they asked me maybe it would roll back, so I kicked it in neutral, and uh, it just sat there. And whenever the boat took off, well, I forgot that I had it neutral and it rolled off the back of the boat. I mean... How much damage you think's done to it? I don't have no idea right now uh, that we'll get it to the shop. And you think, um, what's your, the, what are you carrying a load of? Charcoal. Charcoal? Just raw Is charcoal. Raw? Uh-huh. You think it'll have any environmental... No. no. If anything, it'll help. I rode the last ferry ride on October 21st, 1983, and was one of the very first to cross the new bridges even before they were open. My wife had just broken her nose, and they allowed us to rush her to the hospital using the new bridge on the day before it was officially opened. It's all gone now, part of another era. I suppose that's part of growing older. And I will miss those days and nights spent crossing the ferry. But I have to admit that despite it all, the bridges had to be built. And thanks to the vision of people like Veda Shed, we do not sit in a three mile long ferry line waiting for a ferry to come fetch us.